Hello, I'm John Eldridge, and welcome to the Ransomed Heart audio podcast. For more information on Ransomed Heart Ministries, our resources, and events, please visit us online at www.ransomedheart.com. Hello, friends. John Eldridge here. Thanks for tuning in to the Ransomed Heart podcast. What you're about to listen to is the first in a three-part series on the subject of soul ties, unhealthy emotional and spiritual bonds that take place between people, a subject that I think is very, very vital for the church, for people looking to love well, live well, vital for those of us looking to get free from unhealthy relationships, and really just vital for walking in freedom in Christ and all that he's done for us through his victorious life. And so I think you're going to really enjoy this series. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Ephesians 4, verse 3. Hello, friends. I'm John Eldridge, and with me today in the studio also is Craig McConnell and my wife, Stacy. And the topic that we want to bring to you today is so important. Really, it could have come in a series that we did on relationships. It could have come in a series on inner healing. It certainly could fit well within a series on spiritual warfare. The topic that we want to bring before you is the concept of soul ties, meaning unhealthy bonds between people. Soul ties is a fairly controversial topic in the church, I think partly just because of language, perhaps, partly because of a uh, lack of a scriptural understanding. So I think it will help if we begin with the idea that human beings are given certain capacities by God. We have capacities that can be used in healthy or unhealthy ways. For example, our capacity for worship, right? God has given every human being the capacity to worship, and that was because we were supposed to worship God. But my goodness, you read the Old Testament. I was just reading in Second Chronicles last night about some of the fallen kings of Israel, and they brought in worship of false gods. People will worship all kinds of other things than God, right? It's a good capacity, but it can be taken in healthy or unhealthy directions. Yeah. Another one, John, I'm thinking of would be our capacity for imagination, God gave us an imagination. It's how we think. It's how we process, view things. And that could be used for good or for bad. Exactly. Right. You can create beautiful works out of imagination, but you can also go some pretty dark places with it. Yeah. I think you can slide from reality to fantasy and get lost there. Right. Or how about our capacity to love, right? We're human beings. We're made to love, created to Mm -hmm. love. We want to connect, to um, have intimacy, and we're given this capacity to love God first and then to love others. But people love all kinds of things. We love money. We love the opinion of others. We love the reflection in the mirror, or we don't. It gets messy. Yeah, it gets messy, right? And so another big example, friends, would be the capacity for sex, sexual intimacy. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a beautiful and holy capacity given to human beings by God, Mm -hmm. and it can be used in holy ways within the context of marriage, and it can be used in unholy ways. And God doesn't take away these capacities simply because they can be expressed in unholy ways or simply unhealthy ways. We have capacities, and the capacity I want to focus on today is Scripture describes that human beings also have the capacity to bond, Mm -hmm. and we can bond in healthy and unhealthy ways with one another. Let me first give kind of the scriptural examples of healthy bonding. Let me start with one of the famous passages on bonding from Matthew 19 here, where Jesus is teaching on marriage and divorce, and he says, haven't you read? 
He replied that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. That idea of leaving and cleaving with one another, cleave being the translation in the King James Version. Or Paul, talking about the body of Christ in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he says the body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. And then in Colossians, he kind of builds and expands on that idea. And in Colossians chapter 2, verse 2, he says, I want you to know how much I am struggling for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love. And what's interesting is that word actually means knit together. Mm. That's the translation in the King James, knit together in love. And a little bit later in the same chapter of Colossians 2, verse 18, he's talking about Christ our head, from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. And the idea of held together is knit together, same word in the Greek. We are knit together in Christ. That's a good and healthy bond. And then in Ephesians chapter 4, the verse that I began our session with, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace, same word, Mm. for knit together. And here it's the bond of peace between Christians. So we're united in Christ. We're united in love. We're united in peace. These would be examples of healthy bonding the capacity that's given to us by God, and see all of these bonds are created by the Holy Spirit, and they're created in love, in and through Jesus Christ. But then the Scripture also describes bonds that human beings can form in unhealthy ways. From 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 16 and 17, Paul is saying, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said the two will become one flesh. But he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Now, Paul's giving the example of an unholy bonding here. And yes, in this context, it's very clearly a bond that's formed sexually. Soul ties, unhealthy bonds can be formed sexually. But what's interesting is that the word that Paul uses for uniting here with a prostitute is used elsewhere in the New Testament, not in sexual ways at all, but simply to infer a joining together. So it's not merely a sexual concept. And in fact, Paul uses the same word for uniting with Jesus. Okay, same word. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, in a context that actually has nothing to do with prostitution or temple prostitution or that sort of corrupt sexuality, Paul is simply teaching, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. What do righteousness and wickedness have in common? What fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. So here he's urging, be very careful who you are yoked with. And then What's really fascinating, that passage that I quoted earlier about cleaving, you know, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, that same word is used in the book of Acts to describe something that's clearly outside the marriage bond or even the marriage bed. They've arrested the disciples for preaching in the name of Jesus, and they're trying to decide what to do with them. And then a very good man, Gamaliel, 
stands up in the Sanhedrin and he orders that the disciples be put outside for a moment. And then it goes like this in Acts chapter 5, verse 35. It says, Then he addressed them, Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Theodos appeared, claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him or joined to him. He was killed, and all his followers were dispersed, and it all came to nothing. Now, what's fascinating about this obscure passage is that's the same word as cleave to your wife. Now, we don't know what these 400 men did, some sort of pagan, you know, blood brother ritual or, you know, what have you, but it's this idea of humans can form unholy bonds, unholy ties. We can take this capacity that we're given for bonding and we can use it in healthy or unhealthy ways. We're given this beautiful capacity for bonding by God, but sometimes that capacity can form unholy ties, far beyond unholy sexual ties, though it certainly encompasses that. And so you have a very clear scriptural description here of the healthy and the unhealthy ways this can be expressed. I want to give a couple of examples of what we mean by unhealthy soul ties. And I'll start just with a man that I was counseling a number of years ago. It's actually a fairly common story. In this case, his father passed away when he was a young man, and his mother turned to him, as often happens, for emotional support and that kind of thing. But the problem was it carried on over years, and he really actually ended up becoming a kind of surrogate spouse to her. He really kind of took the place of her husband emotionally, spiritually, even financially. And what happened over time was a very deep kind of bonding took place there that was never meant to take place between a mother and her son. Yes, a woman and her husband, mm. right? But here you have the capacity for bonding in this woman being attached to her son, and he couldn't get out of it. He didn't feel like there were things he couldn't ever bring up with his mom. There was a distance he didn't feel like he could create there. He felt trapped in the relationship because there was this very powerful clinging bond that had been established in their relationship. Speaking of soul ties with moms, I can just speak to that a little bit as a mother myself, but also having had a really strong one with my mother, which I used to describe not just as a tie, but as a bridge, you know, out of metal rope, a really mm. strong one. Um, Mothers have a a beautiful bond with their children, and where it can get into trouble is when the child grows up and is an adult, and if the mother still wants to exert control over her adult child's life through worry or through manipulation or a variety. Clinging. Yeah, clinging, all kinds of ways. Well, that borders then and an ungodly soul tie. And I'm speaking from experience here, not on my son's behalf, but on my own, when I would talk with my mom on the phone or wake up in the middle of the night thinking about her, I would feel so differently Mm -hmm. at the end of the conversation than I had when I entered into it. And I would become aware that things that my mother struggled with really low self-worth, diminishment as a person, as a human Mm. being, would come on so heavy on me. Overwhelmed. Overwhelmed. The spirit of being overwhelmed by life, by the responsibilities, things that maybe I could do on a normal day were suddenly just too Mm. much for me. And then I would remember, or my husband would point out to me, that you were feeling that way before you talked to your mom. Oh, so I would pray, bless my mom, sever ungodly soul ties with her, send her spirit back to her own body where it belonged, and I would immediately feel better, freer, lighter, not overwhelmed anymore. It's kind of amazing. You see, the fruit of it is really important, friends. We're going to unpack this some more. We're going to walk through this. But what we've described as the scriptural basis for bonding 
and scriptural examples of healthy bonding and scriptural examples of unhealthy bonding. And then as you begin to get into the details of what soul ties look and feel like, it's that inability to move past the relationship. It's that feeling cling, controlled, held to. Stace, your experience of suddenly you find yourself feeling everything they're feeling, Mm -hmm. right? Or a really big example is experiencing their warfare right? where, you know, 10 minutes earlier, you weren't yourself. Yeah, John, I'm thinking of a, a man that I know who had a very deep friendship with another man and good friends, a lot of history, a lot of experiences, joy together and an appropriate, wonderful friendship that over the years as they did some business ventures and worked together on projects, there was a connection that was part business, part friendship that grew very, very deep. And a tragedy just affected the relationship, and there was this uh, breaking of the friendship and the business agreements. And this man came to me with just this overwhelming inability to leave that behind, move on. I think I'd use the word paralyzed by the loss of friendship, the loss of the business, and deeply disturbed and really couldn't do much in terms of focusing, regaining kind of his balance, his place. He just wasn't free. There was an inordinate amount of control or power influence or effect from this relationship that mm. that really stunted him. And where that ended up going, John, was the two of us praying, breaking this tie in the name, the power, and the authority of Christ and renouncing that in him, just feeling a new freedom, a lost freedom that he had to kind of re-enter life and deal appropriately, grieve the loss of friendship, business, and so on and so sure, forth. Sure, sure. But he now is free to deal with the issues of life, not kind of laden with this tie to this person in their relationship. Mm. As I said at the beginning, this is part one of a three-part series. However, we have the full series available for you as a 50-minute audio download on our website. And so come to RansomedHeart.com and visit the section on our site of free stuff. And there you can find the full download on this conversation on soul ties. I'm John Eldridge. Thanks for listening.